Good morning. Good morning. Hope everybody's doing well today. It's certainly a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, we have a lot of announcements, and as you know, immediately following service, we're going to have um, hot, uh, dinner underneath the oaks, I think, right? Mm -hmm. So I hope you brought your folding chairs because you need one. Mm -hmm. Um, you don't have to bring anything, so if you no. forgot about it, you don't have to bring anything. Yeah. There's plenty of food. If you didn't bring any food, don't worry about it. There's plenty. Uh, bring your attention to the announcements um, about Vacation Bible School that is coming up. And again, I know I've said this before, but I encourage you to volunteer. Um, the, the things that are needed to be done are not strenuous and don't require a lot of skills in one area or another. We just need bodies sometimes just to have a second person in a classroom because you, know, you have to have two adults. Um, but I really encourage you to volunteer for it. It's, and if you can't, there's a notice on here about sponsoring a child so that, because we don't charge the children anything. They come for free. But we still need to pay for it. Okay, and... There are some announcements in the bulletin that tell about the different meetings that we're having and so forth. And now we're going to celebrate birthdays. Let's see. In July, Lynn Edwards Sr. on today. Carla Ashburn is on the 10th. Denise, is she here today? No. Oh, she. Versus this today, and Patty Washington is the 28th. So let us sing happy birthday to them. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. And many more. <laughs> <coughs> Father, we thank you for this most glorious day that you have given to us. We thank you for the many blessings. Some of them we just we just forget to thank you, but we are grateful for them. Ask you to bless Pastor Frank today. Let his words be your words. Let his message be your message. Open our hearts. To hear what you were saying to each one of us, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And I just realized I said it in the wrong order, but we still thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay, our first scripture is 1 Peter 3, 8 through 22, and it's on that big piece of paper in your program today. I like to read it in the First Peter 8. Finally, all of you being like-minded, being sympathetic, love one another. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit the blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to do harm if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <coughs> Prayer of 
Please join with me in our prayer conf to confession, prayer of confession, on that center part of the bulletin. <clears throat> Almighty God, eternal judge, yet loving Father, we acknowledge and truly grieve that we have at times fallen far short of your perfect will for our lives. We have sinned in our thoughts, our words, and our actions against others, and especially against you, our divine King. We are sorry for our condition of sin, and so despite, desire to turn from it toward you. In your mercy, by the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, forgive all that is past, and grant that we may serve and please you from this point forward, in the new life which is in Jesus Christ. Amen. At this time, uh, the ushers will come forward in order to receive your offerings. And as we bring these financial gifts to the Lord to be used in the ministry of His church and this community, uh, we also will give of our, uh, renew our pledge to give of our time, our talents, um, the spiritual gifts that God gives us in our service. Uh, for all that we are and all that we have, God has given to us. Please join with me in the singing of America. My country is a big sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. such a discharge is unclean, 
whether it continues flowing from his body or is blocked. It will make him unclean. This is how his discharge will bring about uncleanliness. Then 13 through 15. When a man is cleansed from his discharge, he's to count off seven days for his ceremonial cleansing. He must wash his clothes and bathe himself with fresh water, and he will be clean. <clears throat> On the eighth day, he must take two doves or two young pigeons and come before the Lord to the entrance of the tent of meeting and give them to the priest. The priest is to sacrifice them, the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. In this way, he will make atonement before the Lord for the man because of his discharge. And verse 31. You must keep the Israelites separate from the things that make them unclean, so they will not die in their uncleanness for defiling my dwelling place, which is among them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. And I already did pastoral prayer. <laughs> It has occurred to me that I might want to just go ahead and pass the word around that we don't need to keep moving that back over there. together in the praises. And Father, this morning I have one of those praises. Barbara Warnkin has shared with us uh, as she is uh, saying, God bless everyone and giving her thanks to the Lord because she says, I am cancer free. And so Barb, we are grateful with you for the good news. We'll continue to lift you in prayer that God will continue to protect you from those uh, outlaw cells. And Father, we thank you that we are able to lift up praises for other reasons, but we continue to pray. And our hearts go out to, as our hearts go out to other churches who along with us are um, seeking a process by which we may separate from the denomination and join instead with the global Methodists. Lord, we just ask that you would provide the path for us as you have for others, but though we have different paths to take, we rely upon you for the work that you will do. We ask that you would work in the hearts of those in leadership in our Florida conference that have the authority to negotiate with us, to talk with us, and to um, put very little um, regulations on us or none at all. <clears throat> and so, Father, we ask that you would move those hearts and move things along for us in this process. We ask that you continue to pour out your blessings on churches that have already separated and those who are um, planning to stay with the United Methodist denomination. We ask that you would speak to their hearts and minds and that they would continue to seek your way through your holy scriptures and that you would show them how you would uh, use their efforts in uh, furthering your kingdom as we ask that you show us as we seek our new path as well how we might best extend your kingdom and your blessings to others. 
We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to be in, uh, in worship with you. For we know that it is a gift that you have given through the body and blood of Jesus Christ. That you have given us your holy word and you have given us your Holy Spirit. And if we would but receive you, Lord, into our hearts and let you guide our minds, that we may become uh, your sons and daughters, righteous sons and daughters, rather than wayward sons and daughters. And all of us need your spiritual healing. And so we come before you with that expectation and that desire in our hearts. We pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who are distraught because of uh, in emotional wounds, um, illness of family, the death of family, the brokenness of family relationships. And we ask, Lord, that you would heal those things, but especially that you would heal our spirits, spirits that have uh, been disobedient and continue to choose disobedience rather than to follow, learn the way of God and follow the way of God. And so we ask that you would guide us and, and give us wisdom and help us to grow in our faith uh, that we would grow in your righteousness and that uh, we uh, would grow more and more eager to share the good news of God with us to a world who needs you. And we give you thanks in Christ Jesus our Lord. And sing your turn.
uh, as I, whenever I sing America the Beautiful, it reminds me of a time when uh, within our denomination there were those who were trying to um, discourage us from singing these patriotic hymns um, because it was nationalism and it was uh, it, it was uh, as it it gave people that we might offend people that we thought so highly of our country and so lowly of theirs and it might offend some of the people who have migrated here uh, you know, to, to this country uh, we're singing about how wonderful our nation is and I immediately thought of that this last verse, and really all the verses, it's not just proclaiming how wonderful America is, it's asking God to cleanse our every flaw. And there's a reliance upon God to give us the path that we are to follow, and for us to be faithful in following that path. Um, so, and that fits along with what the story, I mean, what the story, what the story is today, children. Uh, what our sermon is about today. And uh, put my timepiece here. Pay attention to it. So I've been away for two weeks on vacation, and uh, you're okay. Okay, I've been. I thought you were trying to tell me something. I've been away for two weeks on vacation. Before that, half a week because of the Florida Annual Conference, and um, I know that I was uh, recently speaking, uh, preaching from the Gospel of, I mean, the, the letter from Peter, and uh, and particularly on these verses eight through twelve that I preached on not too long ago. But I added those, I, I let that be part of the reading in order to provide some context on where we go in these latter verses. And I think I either um, skipped these then, or maybe that's the last place I had been preaching for there. I didn't check on that, but I knew that the, today that the message was going to be coming from um, this, these verses of 1 Peter chapter 3, 13, through 20, uh, through 22, and uh, that's really where the strength of the sermon is coming from. But I'm going to begin this morning with Levit Leviticus. There's a whole lot of uh, verses in uh, the, the chapters before chapter 15 and those after chapter 15 in the book of Leviticus that are giving instruction to the people of Israel, the, the Jews, um, as to the process that they are to go through in order to be spiritually cleansed by having a physical ritual. And um, sometimes, a lot of times people of the world will look at rituals and think that that's just superstitious, hocus pocus kind of thing. How silly to think if you do this, then it's going to cause something to happen. Um, but that's not what is claimed in the scriptures. What is claimed in the script scriptures is that if you make a decision to let God cleanse you, and you follow through with some sort of physical motion of that, then God will cleanse you. We who believe in marriage believe that by coming before God and proclaiming, I believe that God will work in my life and through me and in my spouse-to-be and through her or him, uh, that we will be able to keep these promises that we make to one another before God. And it's not a matter of, I'm so great that I'm going to be the best husband in the world. I thought that was going to be the case, uh, but then I came to realize that I wasn't. But I also knew that in the vows, because our pastor went over those vows with us, I knew that in those vows I had expressed 
that it would be by continuing to strive to follow in God's way that he would work to make our marriage fulfillment, not just my fulfillment, but Valerie's fulfillment, and that for it to be a blessing and for it to be able to be something um, for life. And I, I think in some, so many of these marriages, and, and I've had so many husbands confess to me, oh, it's definitely a miracle that she's still with me. And sometimes it brings a tear because we know what God has done in our lives. Well, baptism is a significant um, tool that God uses in order to bring about in our, in our mind and in our spirit that which God is offering to do in our lives. And when we submit to baptism, we are, we are outwardly expressing what we want God to do inwardly. Now this passage in Leviticus, the Lord told Moses and Aaron, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when any man has an unusual bodily discharge, such a discharge is unclean. Whether it continues flowing from his body or is blocked, it will make him unclean. And there's a lot of ways that that could be. Uh, weeping eyes, uh, nosebleeds, uh, sores. For me, there were a number of times that it was poison ivy or poison oak. And uh, the rash came and then the blisters and then the blisters started uh, popping and just raw open sores. Um, that's an unusual discharge. Um, fall down and scrape my knee. I don't think that's an unusual discharge. That's a usual kind of thing. But where, where there's some, something outwardly that has caused us this discharge. Um, and then there are some other things that are listed um, later as well that are having to do with not unusual. That God would call, would say that is unclean for a period of time. And there's instructions about cleansing oneself. Wash your clothes, wash your body. In some situations, they were to shave their head, their beard, um, all of their body. And uh, then after seven days, shave it again. And then ceremonially wash. And what, was, what God was doing in one thing after another after another, this whole list of things through as you go through the chapters. The first time I read it, I, I felt like, just keep saying the same thing over and over and over. I can skip to when he's not talking about this anymore. But in later years, as I went through reading, looking for, well, what are the intricate dis differences? And why are there differences? Why is there a need to say it over and over again? But there's a lot of things that God says, it will make you ceremonially unclean. It's not a textbook on how to, um, well, keep the COVID virus uh, down until it just goes away. By the way, viruses don't just go away. They keep coming back every year, and they just change. And so there was never any expectation that we would eliminate the COVID virus. And there's no expectation that we are going to eliminate sin. It keeps coming around. But the good news is that the ritualistic cleansing that was taking place, God was saying, it's not just a physical thing that we need to be cleansed. There are spiritual things that we need to be cleansed. And those are talked about as, as well. And it's leading up to the spiritual things that are really Jesus' key focus. And so when we see John baptizing... It's very much like the ritualistic cleansing. When John is saying, repent from sin, repent from sin, turn away from sin. Come and be cleansed. Now John didn't think that by immersing you in the Jordan River, that was going to wash away the sin. But if you come to God and say, God, please cleanse me. And I go through the motions of being immersed in the Jordan River. Um, and then that is my outward expression of this is what I want God to do for me. This is what I know he will do for me. 
and I'm going to accept that. Amen. Now, my favorite memory of doing a baptism, I've got several. A close second or third is the little boy that we baptized, a toddler. Don't remember how old he was, but I'm thinking he was probably three or four, maybe four. And I baptized him, and he was such a perfect little gentleman. I, we had talked together ahead of time of what it meant and such. And, and, uh, and so when I baptized him, and we finished the ceremony, and I put him down next to Mom, he took off running. Now, the, from here to the wall was uh, about the distance from wall to wall. But he took off running, made a turn, he got his all the way to the back, and made a turn all the way back, and made a turn. All. I think he did that lap three times. That's my memory. Three times around. And we just watched and giggled, and then he came back and stood next to Mom. And I said, he's been filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I think he probably was. Yeah. It was. It was a special anointing for him in his excitement. But the, my favorite baptism was in the county jail. Suffice it to say that I had met these boys. Um, they were all still teenagers, but um, seven, um, one was 16, one was 17, and another one 18. They, they were all being tried for crimes, I think, before the oldest was 18. And they were being tried as adults. And uh, I don't remember whether it was one or two that were going to the state prison. They'd already been found guilty. Or, and how many of them that were going to go to the federal prison. But um, I got there, and they were in a separate cell away from the old men. And uh, they were in a juvenile, juvenile area of the county jail. Not a very big jail. And I had been going on a regular basis to do a, a Wednesday uh, afternoon worship time. I'd sing a hymn do uh, scripture, a sermon, and sing another hymn. When I first met them, they didn't seem all that interested. I spoke to them, and they stayed back there, away from me. The farthest they could get back was about where the second row is. And they just listened as I talked to them. And I had three paperback Bibles. And I said, I have some uh, Bibles I'd like to give you. And they came up and got them. And I talked with them a little bit more. They didn't seem so interested. But I said, well, I'll be back next week. For various reasons, I don't remember what. Maybe someone went into the hospital or such. But I didn't get back next week or the week after. So on the third week, I didn't have something that kept me away. But by now, I was feeling guilty and didn't want to go. But I went. And when I walked in, their eyes lit up. They jumped up, came running over to the bars. Pastor, we've been reading in the Bibles, and it said this, and it said that, and it said this. And they were just so excited about the things that they had found. And one of them ran back and got his Bible and came back, and he said, right here, right here, it said that we can be baptized and be saved and become a part of God's people. You know, that they read and figured this out. God had led them to that. And I said, well, yes, you can be baptized. I asked them some more questions about their belief, shared a little bit more understanding and then I said, I'll make, I talked with the sheriff about how we can make arrangements. What it amounted to is we got permission. Since two of them were black and their mamas were Baptists, the white kid didn't have a church. But I was a little more concerned. I wanted mama to know that it was a real baptism. And Baptists like lots of water. They want to dunk you, right? Yeah. And, uh, but I couldn't take them out of the jail. I couldn't take them out of the cell. And also, I wanted them to have a connection in the community. They would have been accepted at my church, but I'm not sure if, because in the panhandle, you had the white churches and black churches. They went to funerals at, at each other's church and sometimes a wedding, but they worshiped separately. And we were working on that as uh, two different ministerial associations. In fact, that's how I first started going to the jail. A black preacher and a white preacher going together. So I asked one of the black preachers that I had made friends with, an older gentleman, will you come and we'll baptize them together, a Methodist and a Baptist. And so we got there, they were in their boxer shorts, ready and waiting for us, jumped up all happy, and uh, deputy let us in the cell, and we had the water running, 
nice and cool. And we had them stand right with his back right against the water, and we leaned them into the water and let it just rain and rain and rain on them. Now, I know that God can do what he needs to do with a handful of water. But I also knew that those boys were about to go to prison, one for murder, one for car theft, and one for, uh, uh, the murder was in a, a drug deal gone sour. And another was uh, robbery with a gun. And they were all going to do some time in a hard jail. And they were all going to need that sense of being washed and washed and washed. But it didn't matter how much water we put on them, that wasn't going to wash away the guilt. It was the relationship with God through Jesus Christ that would wash away the guilt. And so here, when a man is cleansed from his discharge, when, when, the, uh, when you finally heal up from the poison ivy or from uh, the pox or uh, from whatever it was, uh, that you can then uh, be ceremonially clean. On the eighth day, we must take two doves or two young pigeons and come before the Lord to the entrance to the tent of meeting and give them to the priest. The priest is to sacrifice them, the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. In this way, he, the priest, will make atonement before the Lord for the man. This is sort of a, a standard uh, with minor variations depending on what the situation is. For us, that sacrifice is the blood of Jesus on the cross. And that's what we celebrate with thanksgiving every time that we have communion and we receive the bread and the wine. And, uh, and it is the blood of Jesus that is our sin offering. We don't have to go every time something happens anymore to the temple and offer a sacrifice over and over and again. And we don't go and take a bath in the river. Or uh, one of the one of the books that I enjoyed very much. I'm, I'm sad that I lost it at some time in one of the moves. It was a book about from letters from the early church that were giving instruction. Not letters that got in the Bible, but letters that have found, been found that gave instruction. For example, about baptism. Um, for baptism, it is preferred that you would use living water. But if living water is not available then you may use still water. What's living water? The stream that's flowing. Mm -hmm. uh, still water would be like the lake over here. Now, it does have a spring going into it, and it does flow out, so we could actually call that living water. Um, but if you don't have living water, then use still water. What's still water? Well, it could be a pond that isn't going anywhere. It's preferable that it's cool, but if all you have is warm, then a warm pond is fine. It's preferable that it's clean and clear, but if, if all you have is green algae, uh, then, uh, or even sulfur springs in uh, at our Boy Scout camp at, at Lenoche in Paisley, Florida, where along the shore, the sulfur's building up on the branches and things. So there are preferences. But if you live in a town where there is a well or a cistern, and that's where the water comes from, we see in the early church that places where Jesus went and there was a big crowd and he did a baptism, that there's not a river there and there's not a pond there, but there is a well and water could be drawn. And many people were baptized, but that was the only source of water. Another one of my favorite baptisms was in a hospital. I'm going to shorten the story, but it's a lady that I had talked with to a great extent about her relationship with the Lord. And every time I was inviting her to talk about her relationship with the Lord, she told me about her father's relationship. Oh, my father was the superintendent of the school at the church. Her, no, actually the mother was the superintendent of the Sunday school. The father was chairman of the board. And what about your relationship with the Lord? But she didn't have any to say about her relationship with in the conversation, I learned that she had never been baptized. They were waiting for her to make the decision about baptism. And we talked about the significance of that, the meaning of that. And uh, yeah. there was a visit, and I 
and, and I left. And um, I, I was, I, at the time, I was doing a class in seminary where we were going every day to the hospital for five days a week. And I came back after the weekend and found her there in the bed, and she was just, just barely conscious. And she was saying, oh, help me, Lord. Oh, Lord, help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Oh, Lord, help me. Just on and on. And I would lean down close to her and talk to her, and she would stop and, and hear my voice, and then she'd go back into that again. And so I started asking questions. And to shorten up the story, I, I, I asked, are, are you asking the Lord to help you? Are you asking, to, would you like to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins? And yes, yes, yes. Oh, Lord, please help me. Help me, Lord. So a back and forth until I was satisfied that that's what she was wanting. That we had talked about the significance of baptism, and that's what she was looking for. That was she, what she was calling out to the Lord. And I had a nurse come in, and we put some towels under her pillow, and the nurse brought some water, and... Uh, bedridden, I took the water, and with her head laying on the pillow, I put it on her forehead so it would run down the top of her head and the sides of her face, and she was baptized there in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. When I baptize people here, or, or children, I like to, if I had a bigger hand, they'd get more wet, but I like it to dribble and wash down so they have that sense of symbolism. Um, now, Peter talks a bit about this. Peter talks a bit about this as he's saying, um, it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteousness for the unright or the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. So Peter is saying, we're going to suffer in life. Don't do the things that will bring suffering on you that are wrong things, because you deserve it. But you're going to suffer unjustly, and that's okay because Jesus, the righteous one, suffered for the unrighteous so that you could be saved, so that I could be saved. And he did that for me, even though I deserve suffering. So he's saying we, should be, we, we need to be prepared to suffer on behalf of others, like Christ suffered on behalf of others. Jesus had told us um, that blessed are those who, uh, who suffer because of my name's sake. So just suffering because somebody's being mean and taking your property and taking away your rights and doing those kinds of things, that's not suffering for the Lord. Suffering for the Lord is speaking God's truth. Doing it in love, because he said, uh, keeping a, in, in verse 16, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against you, your be good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. See, when we speak God's truth, uh, uh, this is in verse 15, do this with gentleness and respect. Don't be gleeful about, you're going to go to heaven because you're doing that. You know, we're not to be gleeful about that. We're not to be vindictive about that. We're supposed to be gentle and with respect. We're supposed to correct others with kindness, in kindness. And then that way, when others... Uh, will speak slander against us. Oh, you're just, you hate, you hate these people, you hate those people, you're, you're a foe, you know, of this or that. Um, we need to speak the truth in love and take the risk that there are going to be those who lash out at us verbally, maybe even sometimes physically, but speak the truth in love. He goes on to say, at, uh, verse 19, after being made alive, Jesus went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. And now he's going to talk about the ark and the flood. In the ark, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. 
And this water symbolizes baptism and now saves you also. He's attaching the water of the flood that cleansed the earth to the water of baptism for us today that cleanses us of the evil. You know, in reading here, it, the way that it's worded, it, it clicked in my mind that God, it comes across that God is destroying all of the people on the earth because of their wickedness. That's true. But he's doing it to, to save Noah and his family so that the earth was cleansed and now they had a safe place to live. It was not safe for them to be on the earth anymore. So we see other examples of God cleansing. In Leviticus, the teaching of being cleansed outside with water in order to symbolize that God is cleansing our sinfulness as well. There are things that can make us sick on the outside, but the things that make us sick on the inside is uh, our accepting the temptation that is there for us to sin. It's not a removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. When we are baptized, we are pledging that I know that it is the blood of Jesus Christ that has, been, that has uh, paid the price for my sin, and as I'm sim symbolically washed with the water, I am effectively being cleansed spiritually of that sin. I can start up. What did Jesus talk about? Being made as white, as new fallen snow, becoming like a, a, a newly bleached, brand new garment with new, new uh, bleached wool. And here Peter says it saves you, the, the pledge, the baptism saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with the angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. We have examples in the scriptures of Noah that has the ark. Moses. Moses has his own little ark when he's is, as an infant is placed into the Nile River with the crocodiles. And the ark protects him as he goes through the water. But then when, no when Moses was leading the people of Egypt out, the people of Israel out of Egypt, and my understanding from the documents is that there were some Egyptians who converted and said, we're following your God. But as they came out of Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea and God took them safely through the water there and moving from uh, one peninsula across to the mainland, uh, they were passing through the water and they were no longer slaves to Egypt. In fact, the water crashed in and destroyed the Egyptian army that was in pursuit. Elijah, Elijah and Elisha. Elisha, when he was, uh, when the mantle was passed to him to be God's prophet, then crossed, crossed the Jordan River. And there was a symbolism there as well. The nation of Israel, when they came into the promised land, crossed the Jordan, the Jordan River that was opened for them to pass through into the promised land. God uses water in a lot of ways to show this transformation from who we have been spiritually in the past and who we become spiritually for the future. There's much of this symbolism that is there to let us know what is going on in our hearts and minds by God's Spirit working in us. So the blood of Jesus, when he died on the cross, the blood is important. There are those who uh, want to put it aside and think that it's no longer applicable in this day and time. We just need to preach love. And if, if everybody would just love each other, we would save the world. But somehow God wants to use blood and water, and water and fire, the fire of the Holy Spirit to cleanse us. We're going to be having a baptism today at 3 o'clock over um, 
on the lake, in the same area where we do our, our Easter sunrise services. Uh, BJ's property, I was reminded after church, what, but she used to be BJ Daniels, and uh, I don't remember her name, but the Daniels property there, and um, it'll be at 3 o'clock. Some of the congregation have been specifically asked to come and be there. Uh, it's uh, Joel Miller's two grandsons, 15 years old. Uh, let's see. It's, it's Keegan and Connor. Written on here. Gunner and Keegan. Keegan. And we have here, uh, at, um, at the, you're invited to come to the baptism, and it'll be uh, kind of a short thing. And, uh, but then, uh, then head on our separate ways. The family will get together for some social time uh, themselves uh, afterwards. But for today, we have something special. The fishbowl. You know, a um, long time ago, this was our fishbowl for those beta fish. Beautiful fish with the fans on their fins, and, and they, liked, they would fight each other if you put them in a bowl together. Um, we had this for that for a long time ago. It used to be a fish bowl. Then it became a, uh, a bowl that I could put my baby food jars with different size screws and washers and things in so I could look at this and go, okay, there it is. Um, but now it has become a receptacle for holy water. When we were outside, I asked Toby if he would go and get some holy water uh, for this. And I told him about on the stone building, there's a faucet there. And he said, well, we have one at the pump as well. I said, okay, well, by the time you get back here, the water from the pump will become holy water. But he brought it over, and, uh, and I brought it from over here. And what's going to make this holy water is that we're asking God to do that. Make it holy for us. Uh, what we're going to do today is a congregational reaffirmation of your baptismal covenant. Methodists don't uh, don't want to be rebaptizing and rebaptizing and rebaptizing. Now, y'all were already participant. You can do so again. Okay. Um, but instead of rebaptizing, we have this ceremony that's very reminiscent of the baptismal ceremony, uh, ceremony but um, I'm different enough that what we're doing is we're remembering our baptism. I was baptized as an infant. I don't have a memory of that. But I remembered my baptism along the side of the Jordan River. Uh, we could have gone to a spot where people could walk out and be immersed, but there was such a long line, we walked over to a place where we could walk out on the rocks and uh, step down about knee deep or just stay on the rock and reach down and get water. And so we're... And I brought some of that Jordan River water home, used it for a few years until I, I guess somehow a little bit of algae uh, started growing. And I thought, well, I'll stop. I, well, I did put some water purification tablets in it and it got clear, but um, stop. It doesn't need to be Jordan River water. So we'll do this, this ceremony. And when you come up, I invite you that you can put your fingers into the water and just let it let it drip off. I've got the towel here so you can drip over the towel if you want to. You can put it on your face or put it on your hair, whatever you like. If some drips on the carpet, it'll dry because it's just water. And so you will remember your baptism. Um, this morning, there were some people that as they walked up, they said, would you put a, put a cross on my forehead with the water? Sure, I'll do that. So as you come up, uh, you're invited to do so. If you haven't been baptized, I invite that you uh, might talk with me about us having a special ceremony for you to be baptized at some time. Now, that's what we'll do when we get here, but we're going to receive communion at this time. Please join with me in this prayer of humble access. 
We do not presume to come to your table, gracious Lord, trusting in your own righteousness, but rather in your many and great mercies. We know that we are not worthy to gather from under your table, but you, O Lord, are merciful. Therefore, grant us this privilege to partake of this sacrament of your Son, Jesus Christ, so we may walk in that newness of life, which is to grow into his likeness and forever dwell in you and in him and he in us. Amen. I invite you to come up and uh, receive the bread and wine and uh, well okay you know that's a good thought um, I had in mind that we would have uh, you come up and receive the elements it was different outside so you would receive the elements and then we would come up and, and remember our baptism I'm going to back this up a little bit and if y'all would stand closer to there, they can come up to this after and receive the water themselves. Oh, but we haven't said that ritual. Do it anyway. We'll say the ritual afterwards. Come okay. on. Amen. Oh, if there's anyone that needs to remain seated, you're welcome to do that, and I'll come up, uh, come to you. And uh, if anyone's here from another church, you're welcome to come forward and participate if, that, if you would desire. You don't have to be a member of our church. Back, would you like for me to bring the water to you? <laughs> yes. Yes.
Now join with me in this ritual that reminds us of the significance. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, through the sacrament of baptism we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into his mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price, if we accept. Through the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledge what God is doing for us, and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We thank you earnestly, Father, for when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and fought. And, and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark. Through water after the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. And when you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord all that you can tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection, and to make disciples of all nations. He declared, he declared his works to the nations, his glory among all people. Pour out your Holy Spirit by this gift of water. Call to our remembrance the grace of declared to us in our baptism for you have washed away our sins and your cloth you you clothed us with righteousness throughout our lives that dying and rising with jesus we may share in his final victory all, all praise to you eternal father, father through your son jesus christ, jesus christ who with you and your holy spirit lives and reigns forever amen on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power which God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and op oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ Jesus has opened to all nations. I do. According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as God's representatives in the world? I do. Amen. Now let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament. Do you believe in the Trinity of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And now you can uh, we'll say the Apostles' Creed that you have there. Would you leave that? It's not on my friend. I don't think I've got to keep it Yeah, I got it again. Let's join together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by his Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy and universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
Amen. Remember your baptism and be thankful. May the Holy Spirit of God work within you that having been born through water and the Spirit, you may live as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. Let's rejoice in the faithfulness of our God of covenants. We give, we give thanks for all that God has already given us as, as members of the body of Jesus Christ and in this congregation of the Methodist Church. We will faithfully participate in the ministries of God's holy people but our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. May the God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ Jesus, establish and strengthen you by the power of his Holy Spirit, so you may live in his grace and peace. Amen.